good morning. It's good to see you all again and good to be with you, brothers and sisters. Greetings from the brothers and sisters at Redeemer Fellowship Church in Watertown. Uh, so grateful for your partnership and ministry here in Greater Boston. Also grateful for your prayers and your financial support of our church planning work. Uh, may the Lord just be glorified in our churches and more and more churches in Greater Boston. If you would open up in your Bible to Luke 19. Luke 19, great little story about Zacchaeus, no pun intended, great little story about Zacchaeus. <laughs> well, the phrase, it has changed my life, is thrown around a lot today, I'm sure you've said it, I know I've said it. Uh, people will say things like, you know, this blender has changed my life, or this app has changed my life, this, this new workout program has changed my life. And of course, people who say that, normally, uh, the following week, there's yet another thing that's changed their life. We tend to throw around the phrase pretty flippantly today, pretty loosely today. Because there's actually very few things, when you think about it, that make significant, lasting changes in our lives. Of course, there are a few things. Um, the beginning or an end of a significant relationship, marriage, children, a job promotion, a relocating for work, something like that. We have these, these pivot points in our lives that do really result in change. But few things really do change our lives. Of course, nothing will change someone's life like meeting Jesus. Because Jesus brings truly transformative change to the very deepest part of who we are. And it not only affects this life, but meeting Jesus in a saving way also affects the life to come. So we can really say about Jesus that he has changed my life. The story that we're going to look at this morning answers a lot of important questions. Is it possible for a well-known sinner to change? Or to use the language of the passage, is it possible for a chief of sinners to become a true son of Abraham? Is it possible for a well-known, notorious sinner to be forgiven? Restored in their relationship with God and to enjoy fellowship with Jesus. In other words, is it possible to become a Christian? And what is a Christian, anyways? Those are some of the questions this passage will help us answer. And I'm just going to walk through the story and I'll pause at certain points and we'll just think for a minute on what is a Christian. And we'll see four characteristics along the way of a Christian. At least four. There's probably more here, but we'll look at four this morning. Before we get into the details, though, I think the main idea of this passage and of the sermon is that Jesus' mission brings immediate salvation that leads to genuine repentance to even the worst of sinners. And we'll see two scenes that tell us what Jesus came to do. The first five verses, you see that Jesus came to seek out sinners. And in the last five verses, we see that Jesus came to change sinners. Well, let's read the passage. Read with me starting in verse 1, Luke chapter 19. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowds, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. And said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. You might have noticed in the story that it breaks up into these two scenes. In the first scene, it takes place up in a tree. And in the second scene, it takes place down on the ground. And in each of these scenes, there's a similar pattern. It begins with Zacchaeus and the crowds, then Zacchaeus and Jesus, and then finally, each scene ends with Jesus making a comment on something that happens today. 
Just let me show you real quick so you get a sense of the passage. Look at verse 5. Halfway through that verse, when Jesus is speaking, he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Or look at verse 9, the end of the second scene there. Today, salvation has come to this house. So that's how the passage breaks up. Let's back up, though, and go to the beginning of the story. And it starts off by telling us, uh, like most stories, who it's about and where it takes place. Look at verse 1. It says, he entered Jericho and was passing through. That's Jesus. He's, he entered into a, a city called Jericho. Now, this is not the Jericho of the Old Testament. This is a new Jericho. It's about 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And you'll notice there that Luke wants us to know that Jesus was passing through. He's just passing through. He doesn't intend to be here for a long period of time. In fact, Jesus has been moving towards Jerusalem, where he will meet his cross. And if you're familiar with Luke, you know that big turning point in Luke's gospel at the end of chapter 9, when Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem, and he's been making his way there ever since. But before he gets there, he has work to do on the streets of Jericho. And that's what the story is about, and actually the story before. And so we're meant to ask ourselves, Jesus is just passing through. What makes him stop? That's when we're introduced to the other main character of the story there, Zacchaeus, in verse 2. And Luke, he gives us a whole bunch of details about Zacchaeus. Look what he says about him there in verse 2. First, he says that uh, he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. But verse 3, he gives us more details, right? He was seeking to see who Jesus was, and, but on account of the crowd, he could not. Why? Well, because he was small in stature. He gives us four things about who this man Zacchaeus is. The most important, probably, is that he is a tax collector. Now, if you're familiar with tax collectors back then, they were really viewed by everyone else as kind of the worst of the worst. Tax collectors would uh, collect money for tolls and the transportation of goods, kind of like um, custom fees. But here's the thing about tax collectors back then, the way the system worked. They could set the prices. And so they would jack up the price, they would price gouge people, rip them off, they would give the right portion to the Roman government, who they worked for, but then they would pocket the rest for themselves. And so they were despised. They, they were just viewed as a bunch of people ripping off everyone else and getting rich at everyone else's expense. Now imagine you um, got off an airplane with your stuff, and the custom agent said, it's going to cost you $100 to bring your stuff into the country. And so you take out 250s and you give him the 250s. He takes 150, he gives it to his boss. But he takes the other and he puts it in his pocket. Now imagine that happening to you over and over and over again, to you and everyone else you know. Tax collectors, that's who they were. That's Zacchaeus, he's a public enemy. And notice that he's not just a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. So he's the poster boy. He's, he's the face, the representative of some of the most despised people of the day. He's a small man with small morals. He's a little man in every way. He's a chief of sinners. And this brings us to the first characteristic of what it means to be a Christian, of what a Christian is. Christians are people that know that they're sinners. Now, sin is, first and foremost, a nature. It's a condition of the heart. It's a heart that's bent in on self. Self-rule and self-gratification and op that opposes God in God's ways. Sin is a nature. And out of this nature comes all kinds of sinful intentions, motivations, thoughts, and actions. Right? This is what Jesus teaches us. It's out of the heart comes all kinds of wickedness. And that's why Zacchaeus, that's why he lived for himself. That's why he got rich by taking because he's a sinner. He loves himself. Not the right way. His heart is opposed to God. You see, being a sinner, it's not that we do sinful things and then we become a sinner. It's that because we're sinners, with a heart problem, that we do sinful things. So that's why we can't even live up to our own standards. That's why we're so self-obsessed and self-focused. That's why that ugly thought just comes into our mind all of a sudden. That's why we even surprise ourselves with the things that we do and the things that we think. And Christians are people who know what their problem is. 
That's first and foremost what it means to be a Christian, to know what our problem is, but also to know where to go with it. That brings us to verse 3. Look at verse 3. Big surprise of the story, right? This chief of sinners is seeking out Jesus. What's he doing? He was seeking to see who Jesus was. On account of the crowds, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So you read these verses and you get a sense that everything's happening really fast. Jesus is coming down the streets of Jericho. A big horde of people have lined the streets in order to see him. And Zacchaeus is trying to elbow his way through the crowd. And as Jesus approaches, he gets an idea that he's close. Maybe the crowd is starting to erupt with cheers. And since he can't make his way through the crowd, he runs past the cluster of people and climbs up into a tree to get a glimpse of Jesus. Now Luke doesn't give us the reason why. He just tells us that he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But of course we do get a sense from the story, it seems pretty clear that Zacchaeus went to great lengths to see who Jesus was. So there is a high interest in Jesus. That's at least what we know. You know, perhaps he wanted to get a glimpse of one of Jesus' miracles, like the one that had just happened in the story before in Jericho, where a blind beggar received his sight. Or perhaps like so many people, although his pockets were full of money, his heart was empty. Or maybe he heard the rumor that's been going on now for months that Jesus is actually a friend of tax collectors and sinners. We don't know. Isn't it true that it's often the people who are willing to fight through barriers and jump over hurdles in order to see Jesus? It's those people who end up following him. You know, it's the woman at work who will sit down with a Christian friend to read the Bible despite the glances of her colleagues because she must find out for herself who this Jesus is. Or it's the man who walks into church despite what his family might think or how they might disapprove, because he must find out for Jesus, he might find out for himself who this Jesus is. And maybe that's you this morning. You aren't sure, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, but you're interested. And why wouldn't you? I mean, Jesus has changed people for generations all across the world, across cultures and languages for years. There must be something to him. But don't stop. Don't let anything get in your way. Do what you must to get a clear view of who Jesus is. Well, the story's been moving fast as Zacchaeus frantically tries to get a glimpse of Jesus. But now in verse 5, things slow down. Things grind to a halt. You know, if we were watching a movie, this would be the time when the director would, would drown out the noise of the crowd and slow things down and zoom in on this moment. Everything has been moving towards this moment. When Jesus, who's just passing by, sees this notorious sinner up in the tree. In fact, the story takes us away from Zacchaeus to the real focus of the story. The main part of the story is not so much who Zacchaeus saw, but who saw him. And now the real story starts to come into focus. It's not so much Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus, but it's Jesus who came down this very road to seek after Zacchaeus. Look at verse 5. When he came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So here's the climax of the story. Here's the high point. It's, a, it's the big surprise. It's actually Jesus who's seeking him out. And so there among the crowd, Jesus stops. He looks up. He calls him by name, and he invites himself over. He says, I must stay. It is necessary. I must be with you. He insists. Why? Well, this is part of his mission. You look there in verse 5, this word, I must, this verb, I must, it's used throughout Luke, always with reference to Jesus' mission, the mission he was sent on by his Father. Let me give you a few examples so you get a sense of what I'm saying. Back in chapter 4, he says, I must preach the good news, for this is why I came. Or verse 9, or chapter 9, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and killed and on the third day be raised. 
Or chapter 22, he says, I tell you that the scriptures must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For it was written about me. See, the story is not so much concerned about Zacchaeus seeking Jesus, but Jesus seeking to save Zacchaeus. That's what the story is really focused on. It's his mission. This is why he's here. He's come to seek out and save people like Zacchaeus. Of course, that's why he's on his trip to Jerusalem. This is why he's going to Jerusalem to meet his cross, to save people like you and like me and like Zacchaeus. Look back over at chapter 18 real quick. You can see it right from Jesus' own mouth. Look at chapter 18, verse 31. Jesus talking to the 12 disciples, he said, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. And will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise. See, this brings us to the second characteristic of a Christian. A Christian is not only someone who knows that they're a sinner. They're someone who knows that Jesus went to the cross for their sin. There is no such thing as a Christian who has not embraced the cross of Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a Christian who does not know in the pit of his or her soul that that man went to that cross for me. And it's there that he paid my debt. That he took upon himself the penalty for my sin. That it's there where he accomplished something for me. Atoning for my sin, taking upon him his self the very wrath of God that I deserve because of my evil and my rebellion and my wickedness. And if that's you, you can say that about yourself, that praise the Lord, you are a child of God. If you can't say that about yourself, well then it's time that you climb up in a tree and get the best possible view of Jesus that you can. Because it's through the cross that we come to fellowship with Jesus at the table. Look at verse 5 again. It says, I must stay at your house today. At your house. Jesus is not only interested in seeking sinners out and saving them. He wants to enjoy the very fruit of his reconciling work. He wants to be with them, to fellowship with them. And when you think about who Zacchaeus was and what he represented, it's amazing. Right there, in front of all the crowds, publicly, Jesus identifies with that man and says, I must be with you. I must go to your house today and be with you. And then instruction. That if Jesus wants to be with a man like Zacchaeus, he wants to be with a person like me. And isn't it true that we come to Jesus and he ends up being so much better than we thought? That when the lights finally start to turn on and you begin to realize that, you know, I actually am guilty before God. That I actually am a sinner. That, that we come to him initially like the prodigal son back in Luke 15. We come to him and we say, I have sinned against you, and I am not worthy to be your son. Treat me as a servant. And then he says, no, no, no. I didn't go to that cross just to get some servants. I went to the cross to bring my family to the table. There's a cross so that there can be a table. And no sooner... Do we come to him as our savior with our need? Do we realize that we've just come to our brother, our friend, and our Lord? You know, Zacchaeus went up into that tree to see who Jesus was, and Jesus showed him. He's not just some stranger that struts into town, pardons sins, and disappears. He's a friend, a brother, who sits with you at the table. Well, that's the first scene. That tells us what Jesus came to do. He came to seek out sinners. 
But as, G as uh, Zacchaeus, as he climbs down the tree, we enter into the second scene of the story. We see what Jesus came to do. The second thing, that he came to change sinners. And just like that first scene, this one begins with an interaction between Zacchaeus and the crowds. Look at verse 6. So he hurried down and came, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. When they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. You see the contrast there between the two responses to Jesus' words. Zacchaeus' response and the crowds. Big difference. First, let's look at Zacchaeus's. First, his response is immediate, right? He hurries down the tree. He couldn't wait. And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit changes the heart of a man or a woman. To see that, no, Jesus is the Savior that I need. You can't wait to get to him. But not only is it immediate, look, he receives him with joy. He receives him, him, with joy. That's what the gospel is all about. It's about receiving Jesus, not just some detached blessing. But a person. Christianity is not about a get out of jail free card or hedging your bets. It's not just about getting a burden off of your back. It's about receiving a person with joy. It's a third characteristic of a Christian. So a Christian is someone who knows that they're a sinner, that Jesus went to the cross for their sin. But thirdly, a Christian is someone who has responded to the call of Jesus by receiving him and everything that he is and everything that he represents and everything that he offers. It's faith. It's trust. It's reliance upon him. And although the word faith doesn't appear in this story, Zacchaeus' response to Jesus, it reveals his heart. It reveals that he has, he has trusted in Jesus. If you want to hear the cry of faith, we actually have to go to the story right before. Just look over at the story right before. Look at verse 37. This also takes place on the streets of Jericho. Chapter 18, verse 37. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is, Nazareth is passing by. And he, this is a blind man, a blind beggar. And he cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's the cry of faith. It's the humble cry of need for Jesus that receives what he came to give, which is mercy to sinners. And the only reason why we don't hear it coming out of Zacchaeus' mouth is because Jesus beats him to the punch. Before Zacchaeus even has a chance to cry out for mercy, Jesus offers it right there in verse 5. And invites himself over. He says, come to me. So although we don't see the word faith there, we certainly see the actions of faith. We see that Zacchaeus' heart has been changed. He receives Jesus joyfully. So his response demonstrates faith, but the, the crowd's response, it, it, it demonstrates pride. Look at that. Look at it again in verse 7. What happens when they see this? Jesus and this sinner embrace it. They grumble. And they say, he has gone into the guest of a man who is a sinner. They grumble against Jesus. Mercy is offensive to them. It's actually bigger than that. The merciful one is offensive to them. And in their response, their self-righteousness and their pride and their misery becomes plain. They miss his heart. They miss his mission. And so they miss out on the opportunity of Jesus being their guest. You know what? If, if we were there back then, we might have done the very same thing. So a lot of us, whether we are aware of it or not, or whether we like to admit it or not, we tend to have two kind of lists in our head. There are sinners like me, but then there's like the really bad ones. <laughs> like, I might have a bad hair day every once in a while, but I'm not like that. I mean, look who they are. Look what they represent. Look what they've done. There's no way that they can check. And so the, the crowd here, their response, it confronts us with two, two questions. Don't you know that Jesus can change anyone? 
Don't you know that he came for even the worst of sinners? But it's actually deeper than that. It confronts us with another question that makes us a little more uncomfortable. Do I want him to? Do I want him to save those people? Or will they be too hard to love? Will they make me too uncomfortable? Will I be willing to sit around an open Bible with them at their table? And here's a characteristic of, of, of a self-righteous Christian. They're pro-Jesus, like the crowds. They're fans. They like Jesus. They just don't like his mission, which is to save sinners. And by detaching Jesus from his mission, they reveal that they not only misunderstand Jesus, but they misunderstand themselves. Because they're no better than the ones he came to save. And if they would just see that, well then they'd be enjoying fellowship with him at the table as well. Well, the story now shifts away from Zacchaeus and the crowds back to Zacchaeus and Jesus. And before his Lord, we see the evidence of his changed heart there in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Look at this great response from Zacchaeus. He stood up. This is probably later on in the story in Zacchaeus' own house. He stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. I mean, what a change. First, he calls Jesus Lord. He knows who he is. The second thing there is he professes his sin, his need for repentance. It's his public confession. He knows what he's done is wrong, that he has a change of mind about himself and about his behavior. And also look at his repentance. It goes above and beyond. Right? Half of my, my money I'm going to give to the poor, and then from the remaining half, if I've defrauded anyone, of course he had, that's what tax collectors did, I'm going to restore it four times what I had taken. It's hard to imagine that he would have had any money left. And for a man that once had such a tight grip on his money, all of a sudden he's letting it fall through his fingers. He's found a greater treasure. He's found something more valuable than even his money. And we should note here that this is a promise of what he will do in the future. This is not looking back to something that he's already done. Be because repentance flows out of a changed heart. Repentance never causes a changed heart. That Jesus came to Zacchaeus and called him before Zacchaeus had given a penny away. So this is the fruit of, of, a, of a changed life. And it brings us to the fourth characteristic of a Christian. If a Christian's a sinner, someone who knows that Jesus went to the cross for their sin, someone who has received him by faith, by trusting in him, that what he accomplished on the cross actually reconciles them to God. And now the fourth one, Someone who repents and is repentant. Repentance is fundamentally a, a change of mind. It's to no longer agree with our own self-assessment, but to agree with God's. To agree with what God says about who we are and what we need and what he has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to turn from our self-rule, from our life of, of self-centeredness, and turn away from that towards him. And then from a changed mind, a change of mind and a change of heart, it produces a change of life, a change of actions. So we see in, in repentance, we see that there's acknowledging confession of sin. There's remorse over sin. Not the consequences, but that we've sinned against our Lord. But there's also joy because of the forgiveness of sin. And so, repentance is this mixture of both remorse over sin, but also joy because of forgiveness. And we see that in Zacchaeus, don't we? I mean, ver verse 8, you see his acknowledgement, his confession, that, that his remorse. But remember back in verse 6, you see his joy. So a Christian is someone who's known that they are guilty. And there's real remorse for sin. I mean, how... 
we not? We've sinned against our Lord. But there's also mixed with that a, a very a sober joy. Because the very evidence, the very uh, guilt over sin is evidence that this same Lord that we have offended is now working in our hearts. And so the same grace that puts a hand over our mouth and brings us to our knees, ends the self-defense, and accepts what God says about us. That same grace lifts us up and puts a song of praise in our mouth. And so there's both sobriety, remorse, but also joy. So the story ends there with Jesus pronouncing four things, four wonderful things that he says about Zacchaeus. As we close, let's, let's look at these there, verse 9 and 10. Jesus says, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The first thing that Jesus pronounces is that salvation has come. Both uh, being saved from sin and sin's penalty, and reconciled to God as Father. The second thing, though, is that it's happened today. See, that today salvation has come to this house. That the salvation G Jesus offers is for today. You know, other belief systems, you know, they offer someone maybe, maybe something at the end of their life. Somehow, if maybe the good outweighs the bad, maybe, maybe that would be sufficient. But we'll have to see. Not the salvation that Jesus brings. He brings assurance of forgiveness. Confidence that God loves you in hope of heaven. Why? Because it's not based on what we do. It's based on what he accomplishes and what he has accomplished in his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's our assurance of salvation. It's not based on what we do, but what Christ has accomplished. And that we receive that with open hands by faith. So it's salvation, it's for today. But third, he pronounces that Zacchaeus is a true son of Abraham. We don't have time to get into it, but it might be fun for you to do later on today, maybe over lunch with your family or friends, to go back to Luke chapter 3 and see where this whole son of Abraham thing begins. Because there's this debate throughout Luke's gospel is who is a true son of Abraham? And throughout the gospel we see it's not merely those who have the ethnicity of Abraham, but those who have the faith of Abraham. And Zacchaeus is someone who has the faith of Abraham. He's a true son of Abraham. He receives Jesus and then pays the costs of following him. Repentance. And fourth and finally, we see that Jesus says this whole thing is an example of his mission. Verse 10, which just casts a shadow over the whole story. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The lost are, are people who are cut off from Jesus and his kingdom with no way of getting there, no way of finding him, blinded by their sin. Right? Jesus must go to them. He came to seek and save the lost, to find them and bring them to himself. You know, we can't find our way to God. He must come to us. That was Jesus' mission. And his mission isn't over. Today, the ascended Lord, who has sent the Spirit and given the preaching of the gospel, is still seeking out sinners, calling them by name, calling them, drawing them to himself. He calls you. Run to him. And if he's already called you, then let the things of this world fall through your fingers and pay the costs and follow him. So let's answer the question from the beginning. Can someone change? Is it possible for a well-known sinner to become a true son of Abraham? Yeah, it's possible. But only if, Je only if Jesus brings salvation to your house. So don't turn him away when he comes knocking. Receive him. Receive him with joy. Embrace him as your greatest treasure. Make the sacrifices. Let the crowds murmur. And enjoy fellowship with him.
Father in heaven, we thank you for our Savior, sufficient for every need. And we thank you that our hope is found in him, and that you were so glad to give him to us. And we thank you that we can be true sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that we would live as your people, that we would live lives marked by receiving Christ with joy, turning from ourselves, turning from sin, repenting again and again, and following him. In Jesus' name we ask.